All right. Tam's Supermax Prison at the tip of southern Illinois was designed for one thing, sensory deprivation, permanent solitary confinement. No phone calls, no contact visits, no communal activity, no yard, classroom, cafeteria, or chapel. Men never leave the cell except to exercise alone in a concrete pen or in a cage if they're mentally ill. Food is pushed through a slot in the cell door. In 2006, a group of artists started the TAMS Poetry Committee to provide the men with some social contact. We sent poems, they sent poems. Bruce wrote back, hi committee, is this for real? I can't believe someone cares enough to send a pick-me-up to the worst of the worst. The men wrote about their hallucinations, psychosis, self-mutilation, and suicide attempts, all expected consequences of solitary confinement. Interaction and sensory stimulation are physiological needs. Without them, our brains go into crisis. When people break down in solitary, it's not because they're weak, it's because they're human. One man finally wrote, hey, this poetry is great, but could you please tell the governor what they're doing to us down here? So in 2008, we launched TAMS Year 10, a legislative campaign, oops, to reform or close the Supermax at the 10-year anniversary of its opening. Men were originally supposed to be there for one year, but at this point, one-third of them had been there the entire decade. Our strategy was to ask for oversight from the legislature. Prison reform is hard enough, but getting politicians to stand up for men labeled the worst of the worst was considered hopeless. Veteran attorneys scolded us that bringing attention to these guys would make things worse. The men felt they had nothing left to lose. The campaign had three organizing principles. Let the men from TAM speak for themselves. They can undo the myth of the worst of the worst. Two, recognize that we're bystanders to torture, but we don't have to be. And three, every event has a goal. Not permitted, just putting information out into the ether. Ask for concrete political action and keep track of it. We focused on decision makers. Yay. Spreadsheets. <laughs> we focused on decision makers and built relationships with good legislators by volunteering for them. Then we held hearings, introduced legislation, worked with great reporters, pulled in human rights monitors, and negotiated with the Department of Corrections. We organized lobby days, tactical media campaigns, and cultural projects like the TAMS Year 10 performance where we reenacted scenes from the campaign playing ourselves, Supermax subscriptions, which allows you to donate frequent flyer miles to buy magazines for prisoners, and photo requests from solitary. We invited men in isolation to request a photograph of anything at all, real or imagined, such as my auntie's house at 63rd and Marshfield facing east, a lovesick clown with a feather pin, <laughs> and a scroll. Yes, he got three of these. <laughs> my mom in front of a mansion with a Hummer and money on the ground. <laughs> this is actually a, a sad story because his mother had died while he was in Tams and he sent her photo. And he said, grieving your mother in isolation is a form of anguish like no other. Willie asked for a photo of us holding a prayer vigil at Bald Knob Cross in Southern Illinois, praying for his deliverance from Tams and to be granted parole. That's us. Last year, um, Willie actually was granted parole after 36 years, and we held a welcome home party for him <laughs> where he talked about the photograph and he ceremoniously marked himself as free. Tyrone wanted to see Tam's Year 10. He said, I'd just like to be able to put the faces to the names we've seen over the years so the humanity of each can shine forth. We also made these images into legislative action postcards and even displayed them in the State House in the hallway where we were often waiting to pounce on committee members coming out of their secret <laughs> meetings about prison spending. Lobbying, and there's Brenda, is when you seek to influence a politician, usually in a lobby. <laughs> you have to, you have to, 
you often also have to pull them off the floor while they're in session. How do you do that? You hand the doorman your business card to give to legislators, and then you push your way forward to talk to them. Here are me and Brenda surrounded by the guards union at one of the most tense times. In 2009, we cracked the nut. Governor Quinn appointed a new corrections chief to review the supermax, and he announced a plan for reform. We held the party on the right side of history to thank our brave and principled legislators who truly made this happen and to celebrate ourselves for years of hard work. When the 10-point plan stalled, we started a new push to cut TAMS out of the budget. Last year, our governor proposed the outright closure of TAMS. Oops. However, the powerful guards union staged a fear-mongering campaign to keep it open for the jobs that they weren't actually losing. The union was AFSCME, AFSCME who MLK marched with in Memphis in 1968 with the message that workers' rights and human rights are inseparable. In response, the mothers lobbied in Springfield. These are their special lobbying cards. And, go moms, <laughs> and marched to AFSCME headquarters. They said, my son is not a paycheck and torture is a crime, not a career. This January, after a long, painful battle, Governor Quinn shut the Supermax down. We sent the men this card, oops. We sent the men this card to their new prisons, drawn by a child whose dad's was, dad was in TAMS, and he was so happy it was closing. As you can see, TAMS is being destroyed by a wrecking ball with aliens overhead. <laughs> the men described their journey back into the world of sensation. David wrote, our natural human senses, having been so repressed at TAMS, were suddenly and shockingly activated simply by boarding the IDOC bus. The smell of diesel fumes was overpowering, foreign yet familiar, comforting and nauseating. Juan said, I can actually shake my neighbor's hand. It was surreal. Joe, when I first heard of the TAMS Poetry Committee, I thought I needed a poem, like I needed a 25th hour in a day to spend in that box. <laughs> Who would have known? So now we are proudly working on Governor Quinn's re-election and advocating for these men at their new prisons. We're also expanding the photo project to New York and California, yay Janine Olson, and starting a variety show about prison called the Honey Bun Comedy Hour. It's so right that the TAMS Year 10 office last year, filled with fi five years of files, fact sheets, and ephemera, was an art installation at the Sullivan Galleries. It served as the hub of the closure campaign, in view and on action, with no division between art and politics. As artists with real-world political goals, we needed to engage with government systems. That's legislative art. Prison policies are made by the state, so you go to the state to change them. I'm enthusiastic about legislative art because it is engaging. These are the trophies we gave AFSCME that they didn't accept. <laughs> Unpredictable and rewarding, but mainly because it is necessary. It's easy to see why we had to accept this prize together and on behalf of everyone in TAMS Year 10. Out of isolation came solidarity. Allow me to further introduce Brenda Townsend, Reginald Akeem Berry Sr. and Daryl Cannon. You stay standing. Come on out. Stand over there. Stay together. idea how wonderful these folks are. <laughs> and you're so right to applaud them. So, Brenda, oh wait, y'all, oh, I'm cut off. Y'all have to let me introduce them. It's not fair. 
Here we go. We got you back. Okay, Brenda. <laughs> Brenda bravely told her son's story to everyone who needed to hear it, including the press. She and the other moms forced legislators to see the senselessness of inflicting lasting mental damage on their sons and the toll it takes on the whole family. She's been a pillar of strength for TAMS Year 10 through years of work meetings, campaigning, phone banking, lobbying, and of course, sending cards to the men. Akeem and Daryl have both spoken at so many hearings, meetings, and events, I can't even count them. Akeem also played a key role by turning out many people to press conferences, rallies, you have no idea how popular he is, <laughs> and connecting us to West Side State Senators who have been critical allies. With his wonderful wife, Denise, he co-founded Saving Our Sons Ministries to break the cycle of violence on the West Side by mentoring, engaging, training, and employing at-risk youth and ex-felons. Work awarded by Mayor Daley and praised by Chief of Police Gary McCarthy, and that's because when these guys are given a chance to work and he negotiates contracts so they can, they do not end up in prison. Daryl, oops, you didn't see this, I'm sorry. Gotta look at that, saving, sorry, saving our sons. Daryl was tortured into a murder confession by Chicago police as part of a torture ring covered up for decades, still being unraveled. After a 24 year fight to have his conviction overturned, he became an extraordinary spokesperson against both the unofficial torture by Chicago police and state-sanctioned torture by our Department of Corrections. He's a supervisor for ceasefire, preventing and interrupting violence in the streets, on the streets. He was assigned to Lawndale, a neighborhood which had a homicide every two or three weeks. After he took over, there were zero homicides for a stretch of 10 months. Violence plummeted. <laughs> It's an honor to share the stage with them and with the great Mr. John Forte, and I'm so proud to be forever linked to Khaled Harani, even though it's through no choice of his own. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm John Forte, and uh, I think I speak for everyone here when I say that Everyone that I'm sitting on the stage with right now is a beacon of hope, and uh, I feel completely honored to be able to uh, ask you guys a few questions. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. So, Laurie Jo, first and foremost, I'm gonna start with you. This is actually a two-part question, um, not the one that I said I was going to ask you backstage. Good. All right. <laughs> How does one practice legislative art and not be discouraged in a climate where you have a two-year election cycle, where as soon as you talk about criminal justice reform, you can be labeled as soft on crime, so nobody wants to touch that with the 10-foot pole, and then on the other side, you've got uh, a public perception of prisons and the inmates therein that it's, for the most part, propagated by Hollywood and, and, and media without people actually having any sort of semblance of, of the reality of the situation. Was there a second part? Well, it, it was two, so, so oh, one, that's two. on okay. the one side you're talking about the, the politicians oh, and then, and then okay. the public perception. Well, you know, part of my message and part of what I learned through this campaign um, is that legislators have a really bad rap. And even though I completely agree, I think the main reason that, that we have the terrible, terrible criminal justice system and, and prison conditions that we have is because of legislators being tougher and tougher on crime. I completely agree with that. But the fact is there's a lot of really great legislators. And Akeem and I um, are close to a, our West Side State Senator, Patricia Van Pelt, who's amazing. Um, Julie Hamas, I could name a bunch, and you saw them, of legislators who took this problem seriously, really researched it, really understood it, you know, and came to a million meetings and really pressured the Department of Corrections to do better. And so even though it is true that there's this cycle of, you know, it, it certainly didn't serve them to work on this issue, none of them, but they did it anyway. And another thing to think about is, in terms of prison conditions, and why I am actually really optimistic about making change in Illinois anyway, um, prison conditions are under the executive branch. 
And so the executive branch can make changes and do stuff, and the legislators can pressure them, and they don't even have to publicly vote on a law. You know, you can just do stuff behind the scenes. So, you know, I, 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 this would not have happened without our legislators. And how do you influence public perception uh, uh, and, and, and actually draw a, a, a deeper truth? By keeping my mouth shut and letting them talk. <laughs> and to that point, I will, I will now move it on. <laughs> Brenda, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Herman Wallace was released from prison. He served 41 years in solitary confinement. I, and this is the longest, uh, the longest term of solitary confinement in, in history, if I'm not mistaken. And the day that he came home, I posted something on my Facebook page saying, you know, Herman Wallace is home. Let's put an end to cruel and unusual punishment, to which someone that I do not know personally responded, well, the guy was in prison. What, he wasn't in a hotel. At least he got three hot meals and a place to sleep. What would you say to this person? The person that made that response? The, the, person, that, the person that responded in that, in that. Well, yes, okay. In, 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 in polite company. Yes, okay. I would say to that person that made that response that I'm not against people being in prison. What I'm against is inhumanity to lock somebody up in a box that's like a coffin. They have no human contact. They can't, I haven't touched my son in over 17 years. He was in TAMS for 14 years under Supermax. I totally disagree with that comment. I'm not saying you shouldn't punish a person for a crime, but that is just inhumane. Animals are treated better. And I stated that over and over and over in our campaign that people are outraged when you treat an animal that way, but you treat people like this, and they were considered a science projects. This is what they call them. They were a project that the state decided they would get some men together and lock them up like, and treat them like they weren't human. And it's very difficult for me to talk about it, and I thank everybody for coming out to hear this, but it needs to be exposed and TAMS Year 10 did expose TAMS Correctional because it was hidden from the world. And I'm so glad it's closed. When they closed it, it was right at Christmas. That was the best Christmas present I had ever received. Now, now uh, Brenda, you said to me backstage that, yes. that part of what keeps you going is the fact that you know you're not alone. Can you yes. speak to the strength of the other mothers that you've yes. met uh, along the way o over these? Few years. Yes, we met. I met quite a few moms, and we worked together. And so I felt alone at first. And so when I started working with the other moms, it let me know that I'm not alone. There's other mothers out here that that are suffering just like I was, and it, it helped me a lot. God bless, uh, Akeem. Here you are. You are in wh wh which prison were you in before before times? Graham. You in Graham, yes. and. There wasn't an incident. There wasn't, let's say, a fight on the yard or anything like that. No, sir. You're going about your day-to-day your, your -day business, and then you get, uh, you get tapped on the shoulder, and you're being moved. What was it like to go from general population, where at least you had some form of camaraderie, to complete isolation? And not for the year that, that, that they told you or, or that you expected, but for eight years, if I'm not mistaken? Yes. Well, to be succinct, it was complete culture shock. You know, uh, as I mentioned, I had been in Graham, uh, which is a medium uh, security facility. And I had been acquiring good time, you know, which they give you for good behavior, uh, time off your sentence. And, you know, having set a plan in play, I'm looking, trying to meet my son's college graduation date. So I had an agenda in my mind I was set trying to match. And to be told, uh, cuff up, you being transferred, you know. I mean, 90% of me was trying to say, no, 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 they can't take me there, I ain't done nothing. Mm -hmm. But that small 10% said, well, there's a probability you might be going there. And uh, having been cuffed up, driven through the southern part of Illinois, and when it van actually went underground, I knew it was over. I knew it was over. But I was still optimistic because you know, the director at that time, you know, he had contacted my family and told us, you know, that uh, in one year, if there weren't any disciplinary problems, 
I'll be released and sent back to a regular institution. And so I took this, this small ounce of hope to my, my wife and my sons, and I asked them, listen, I need you to work with me on this. You know, and they agreed, okay, we will move from Chicago to Springfield mm -hmm. to make it a shorter route, because it's eight hours driving from Chicago to Towns, one way. Eight hours going back the other way mm -hmm. for a one hour visit, 16 hours on the road. And so again- And, and was it a contact visit? Were you no, uh -huh. no, no. The initial visits, again, was the most barbaric uh, uh, visit I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Not only was I strip searched, before, prior to going on the visit, you know, my legs were shackled, my hands were shackled behind my back. They actually put us in a fiberglass room where it was a concrete stool. And when they put me in the room, my legs was actually placed behind the stool where I was leaning at a 45 degree angle. And I'm like, hands cut behind my back and he had a microphone in, in, in the glass, whereas you talk to the microphone, you wait 30 seconds, then you let your people talk, or the, otherwise the acoustics will drown you out. But again, it was culture shock, you know, and uh, to have them to lie and be duplicitous like that, you know, that one year turns into eight years. And there before the grace of God go to you. Uh, here you are, home, not bitter, obviously, because you've channeled that energy uh, of, of being away and you've, you've transformed that into SOS, uh, Save Our Sons. Yes. We were speaking briefly backstage and you were talking particularly about taking you know, these, the, these young men and women from, from, from their hoods, from their six block radius, and then showing them new things in, in, in different parts of town. How important is it for these young men and women to see things beyond, their, their, beyond what they immediately know, and in many cases fight over uh, in terms of turf wars and uh, what we're witnessing, especially in Chicago, uh, with, the, with the murder rates being uh, as, as prevalent as they are right now? Well, I would think it's being awfully important. You know, uh, we as people are visual people. And that which you're exposed to will be that which you emulate. Mm. You know, Michael Jordan couldn't become the best basketball player in the world had not he saw uh, other Dr. J and other people shoot a basketball. Thurgood Marshall couldn't have became the great lawyer and judge he was had not he seen someone else who had litigated. And so in this regard, these young people are exposed to guys who are riding, like I said, a six block radius with their 22s on their cars. And believe it or not, they have what's called a blue light camera in Chicago, where they would designate a spot as being a hot zone for drugs and put a camera there. But here's the, the kind of dichotomy with that. If he had a spot right here and they put a blue light up and made him move to the middle, I had a spot right here, they put a blue light up and make me move to the middle, eventually we're gonna clash in that middle about that little piece of land. And so people were being killed, again, for small parts of the land. So again, it's by the grace of God that we was having the opportunity to expose kids to different things. You know, uh, Event Creative, Center Space Chicago, and other sorts of things. We was fortunate enough to have taken uh, a host of young men and women off the corners who would normally be selling drugs this summer. We paid them $10 an hour and asked them would they work a job if they were given the opportunity to. And they worked. And uh, I mean, we only lost two guys out of 40 mm -hmm. back to the streets. Daryl, you have uh, obvious, obviously achieved so much since, uh, since you've been home, and, and you came home in 2008? Correct. So within five years, you, uh, you're, you're definitely a force to be reckoned with in the community. I applaud you for that. You have a family that uh, stayed with you throughout, uh, th throughout your incarceration. Yes, sir. You have adult children. Correct. Can you speak to the toll that your children went through uh, during your, your incarceration and essentially you as a father, uh, what it meant for you to be there for them in whatever way you could during the time that you're away? I missed the crucial years of my children growing up, uh, but one of the things that I did early during my prison time is that Anytime my daughters or my son came to see me, I made sure that they understood that this is never where you want to be. Any fool can go to prison, but it takes a wise person to stay on the streets and to be creditable and to do something constructive 
with their life. And because of that, uh, two of my daughters <laughs> went into corrections. One is a sergeant at a women's prison. My other daughter uh, is going for the lieutenant's exam uh, in a, a mixed prison. And both of these is in Southern Illinois. So the message was clear that there was nothing to be glamorized about being in prison. My son passed away. Um, he had um, a murmur in his heart when he was born. And as he got older, it got worse. And while I was in prison, uh, he had a heart attack and he didn't make it. So I wasn't able to have a success story for him. But while he was living, he had never had any encounters with the police or going to jail because of the fact that I stressed to all my children that my situation should never become their situation. Be opposite of what has happened to Daryl Cannon. And by the grace of God, they did just that. Daryl, someone puts you uh, in a cage and they shut you off from the world. And they treat you as subhuman, as if you are not upright, as if you are not a man. And they don't just do it for a matter of hours, they do it for years. Mm -hmm. Where do you find your dignity? Where do you find your sense of self? Why are you not paralyzed and, 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 and demoralized and, and, and berated after how you were treated? Well, first I give thanks to God. Secondly, uh, my mother and my grandmother were the house head holds. Even though my grandfather and my father was there, my grandmother and my mother ran the house. Simple as that. <laughs> you know? And both of them are now deceased and their spirits was embodied in me all while I was in Supermax. So I became a stubborn son of a gun that just refused to be broken. Period. There was times that I came close but again uh, God was first, my mother and grandmother was second. They was there, boy, you, you're not going to go crazy. You're not going to do what you've seen other prisoners do here. I've seen prisoners who literally tried to kill themselves by cutting their wrists to bleed to death, uh, cutting the upper part of their thigh where they could bleed. Uh, some will get on the concrete desk and go head first uh, into the concrete in order to try and relieve the misery, the pain, and the suffering of having been in Tams. And some uh, have just destroyed their lives mentally so bad that it's doubtful if they can recover. And I refuse to be a part of that statistic. In my mind, Daryl Cannon was going to walk out of there the same way he walked in. I was asked to moder moderate a little bit and, and, and do a little interview. I was not asked to give you my unsolicited opinion on the matter, but since I know what the rules are and I know how to break them, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to close by saying that when I see the great work that Daryl, Akeem, Brenda, Lori Jo, what they're doing, closing this sort of chasm, that this perception uh, of, of what takes place behind that wall uh, with our prisoners, who are not only criminalized by the court systems, but by society at large, because you keep paying uh, this, this, this crime forward, even though you've paid your time to society. That scarlet letter does not just vanish when you come home, if you come home. So what you're looking at on this stage, you're not looking at things. You're not looking at, at subhumans. And I actually speak from experience, because in 2001, I was sentenced to 14 years in a federal prison. And in 2008, after serving seven years uh, of that sentence, President Bush at the time commuted my sentence. So while I can relate to, uh, to, 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 to these two great brothers, um, insofar as, uh, you know, I, I did a, a little bit of time in isolation, but not years. I mean, mine was weeks whenever I, you know, got a shot and went to the box for a couple of weeks and I almost lost my mind. 
So, literally. So, to sit here and to see this, this courage and, 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 and this, this braveness, um, it, it inspires me, and I would encourage you all to keep going, to keep fighting the good fight, and uh, again, it is an honor. Thank you, Creative Time, for allowing us to sit with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a kind person. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm going to get out of the way. So don't leave yet, because we have one closing thing to do, and I think some people are going to help us take the chairs off. To close our presentation, we have a simple act of endurance for you. Reginald Akeem Berry Sr., Daryl Cannon, and Brenda Townsend are going to stand for a period of time, one minute for each year they spent in solitary confinement in TAMS. <laughs> Sorry. Brenda will stand in for her son, Herman Townsend, who's out of TAMS but currently at Pontiac Correctional Center. <laughs> 